Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Gruff Talk, where each week we take a deep dive into all the ways we can feel better, look better, live better, and age better. I'm your host, Barbara Hannah Grufferman. Today, I'm joined by one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, sports medicine physician from the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City, Dr. Jordan Metzel. Dr. Metzel was a guest on Gruff Talk a few months ago when we talked about keeping knees strong for life with the right exercises and the best treatment when needed. That episode quickly became one of the most downloaded and listened to episodes in 2022. If you haven't heard it yet, check it out because knee pain is crazy, crazy common. Today, we're going to hear why moving is probably the best medicine for the most common aches and pains many of us experience, and Dr. Metzel will answer questions that the Gruff Talk listeners sent in earlier this week. Thank you, everyone. A great big thank you to everyone who took the time to send in a question. I just hope you like the answers. (laughs) Dr. Metzel is widely known for his passion for sports medicine and fitness and encourages everyone to view moving more as the best medicine in the world. He's a best-selling author, a national TV personality, and he created the Iron Strength Workout, a functional fitness program for improved performance and injury prevention that he teaches in fitness venues throughout the country. And guess what? You can do it too, and it's free. Just look for the link in the show notes. Okay, in just a minute, we'll get the conversation started. Stay tuned. I'm so happy to welcome back to Gruff Talk, one of my favorite human sports medicine doctor, best-selling author, founder of Iron Strength Program, which is done by, I don't know, what is it now? Like over 12 million people worldwide. A lot of people. A lot of people. And one of the most motivational people I have ever ever met in my entire life, Dr. Jordan Metzel. Welcome back to Gruff Talk. This is your second appearance. You say that to everybody. Come on. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And and it's a pleasure to see you, Barb. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, it's always great to see you and talk with you because we have a lot to talk about today. In fact, I told everyone that you were going to be on with me again, and they sent in a ton of questions. I had to cull through them all and like choose a few. And so we're going to get to that. But I just want to remind everyone that the, and you too, the last time we were together, we talked about knee health and how to keep knees strong and what to do if you have osteoarthritis like I do, and I'm a runner, as you know. So uh, your advice was really good. And for anyone who hasn't heard that episode yet, just after you listen to this one, scroll back and tune into it. So like I said, you are going to be answering some questions that uh, Gruff Talk listeners had sent in through social media and email. But before that, I really wanted to talk with you about your whole concept of movement medicine, because your goal in life, Dr. Metzel, is to make sure that we stay mobile and independent and age better, which is my goal, my personal goal, yeah. as well as my goal for all of my listeners and readers. So first, tell us, before we get to the questions, what is movement medicine? So I, you know, I think the idea is that you know, it very much comes out of my own experience and that 25 years ago, I started the whole process of going to medical school and residency and fellowship and then being a doctor, I guess almost 30 years ago. Damn, a long time, a long, (laughs) a long ass time ago, I started that process. And when I went through that process, I very much went through in the traditional way, you know, kind of pick a specialty, which ended up being sports medicine, which ended up being diagnosis and treatment. And so, you know, somebody has a a hurt knee. What is it? Is it a torn meniscus? Is it a torn ACL? Is it arthritis? You have a hurt back. Is it muscular back pain? Is it a stress fracture? Is it a herniated disc? What's the cause of the pain? How do we diagnose it? And then how do we treat it? And that's kind of what I did for a whole host of years. That was kind of one kind of pillar of my life. Right. The other pillar was being active as somebody that grew up in a very active family with three very active brothers, two very active parents, activity was a big part of what I did growing up. And then when I got into med school, I think I really realized that there was a, you know, a, a whole separate language of medicine that I had to learn, which was different than, you know, French or Spanish 
very complicated in some ways and a huge amount of vocabulary and a lot of hours sitting and studying. Yes. And one thing I noticed was that my brain worked way better after I exercised. That it just, I was able to concentrate and focus. And kind of what, what that was, the introduction to me was that there was something mental slash psychological about my ability to process information and to learn with exercise. And so that was kind of the first foray into that world for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, exercising every day in med school turned into exercising during residency when I didn't have much time and was doing kind of, I remember I was, I brought a jump rope to the on-call room in residency to jump rope in the stairwell. <laughs> and people thought I was nuts, which I probably was. Were you doing burpees back then? That's no, I didn't what know I what a burpee know. was then. <laughs> did not know what a burpee was back then, but it was jumping rope. And it was very, you know, activity was a way to kind of deal with, you know, being up for many, many hours in a row and to getting, again, huge informational dumps into your head and trying to kind of process all that. And so that was that. Was that. And then as I got further into my career, you know, I was kind of eventually into sports medicine, diagnosing and treating. And then on the other side, I was, you know, doing marathons and triathlons and being very active. So I had like the life of medicine and the life of being very, very active. Mm -hmm. You really do walk the walk and talk the talk. You do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what happened over time was that the world started bleeding into each other or I guess overlapping. My Venn diagram started from two separate circles to two overlapping circles. Mm -hmm. And then I recognized that for myself, my brain worked better. I felt better. I was better able to do my activities. And then eventually my knees hurt less, my back hurt less when I, would, when I did exercise and I did strengthening exercise. And so over time have kind of melded these two worlds together, uh, not only still very much being a, a doctor and sports medicine doctor, but also prescribing exercise and figuring out the most effective ways to do that. And then about nine years ago now, we started one of the country's first seminars for medical students at Cornell called Prescribing the Medicine of Exercise, which went to went about teaching med students how to prescribe exercise to their patients of the future. And that's brilliant. And by the way, not a, I'm sure you would agree, not enough doctors do that. Well, we didn't, when we looked through the curriculum to try and figure out how to put it together, there was essentially no curriculum. So we kind of made it up on our own and we still do largely because there's not a uniform curriculum, which is frustrating because, you know, this is one of the things that affects every patient that you will see for your entire life is how do you get them moving? And, and the reason yeah, and that's the science important, is there. I mean, since well, yeah, then, so, yeah, the science has really yeah. evolved mm -hmm, That's to exactly that. what I was going to say, which is that, you know, it goes beyond how do you get the, you know, the tightest buns from bar class or the best abs from, you know, a boot camp class. The question is, you know, what's the medicinal value of exercise? And, and, and so the, this concept of movement reaches across the entire spectrum of the human condition from your brain, anxiety, depression, sleep, memory, concentration ability, some of the things I found early on, you know, mood. Weight management, weight management, weight loss, mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, hyperlipidemia, bone to health, bone health to bones to arthritis to osteoporosis to thirteen types of cancer, which are now linked to regular activity. Meaning, if you exercise regularly, you're less likely to develop these types of phenomena. You know, obviously, obesity. Yeah, diabetes I mentioned. So, the, you know, really is this kind of all-encompassing concept that movement is not only a great thing to do and, you know, whether whomever you are, but that it's a very effective drug. It works for every single person that takes it anywhere around the world. It's free. It's 100% efficacious and has zero side effects. And if you list any drug, like you don't have to have the thing at the end. Like if you take this drug, you can expect double vision right. and <laughs> urination and a rash and your you know, leg will fall off. It's like literally it works. It has no side effects and everybody can do it. So to me, I feel like we're, you know, I spent a lot of effort to try and kind of play catch up on this and to get other people to see this similarly. And, and that's kind of where it comes from. And it's also, long you, that's the you know, for, no, and it's a great answer. 
and you're a real champion when it comes to convincing and motivating people to move more in their lives. And also the the issue too, though, is there are people, would, and we will be getting to some of those questions in a minute, uh, there are people who are, especially as they get older and enter midlife and beyond, that they're maybe worried or nervous about moving more or moving in new ways because they do have some aches and pains that they did, maybe even an injury that they didn't have when they were younger. So it might even be causing them to stop moving or slowing down their moving. And I think that that's like everything you're saying is really counter to all of that. And that's something I really want to make sure that our listeners understand there are safe ways to move your body depending upon what your particular issue is. So for example, let's get to one of those questions. This one comes from Patricia, who sent in this question. I had a total hip replacement over a year ago and still have a lot of pain in the whole area, in my hip area, my buttock area. Any recommendations for treatment and or what's the best exercise or exercises to help reduce the pain and discomfort that I feel? So, you know, the first thing to say is that pain generally happens for a reason. You know, the whole idea of pain is weakness leaving the body is true in some small subset of issues, but generally speaking, pain happens for a reason. And so I spend a large part of what I do during the day trying to figure out why somebody may or may not be having pain. So if it's hip pain or back pain or knee pain, you know, what's causing the pain? And so that starts with a description of the kind of pain somebody's having. Is it pain all the time? Is it pain at nighttime, pain at daytime, pain with walking, pain with rest? Does it shoot down their leg? I get a description of the pain, which always helps me to try and figure out, you know, even from somebody's story, what they're telling me. And all of a sudden, different things come to my mind based on what somebody's pain description is. Now, so with Patricia, she's talking about having had a hip replacement a year ago and having pain all the time. So when I hear something like that, I like to first of all figure out what does all the time mean? Does that mean like 24-7? Does that mean when I walk? Does that mean nighttime? Is that waking me up? Those things are all different cut types of pain. Right. Even though to the patient, sometimes yeah, it's very difficult to kind of sort out, you know, I just know my hip hurts. But to us, you know, things like pain all the time can be a problem with the prosthesis that she had put in or an infection or some underlying bone problem that's causing 24-7 pain Mm -hmm. versus pain with walking, maybe a problem with the prosthesis, the hip replacement, but more likely maybe a problem with the muscles around the hip not being strong enough to support the replacement she had or potentially a nerve getting pinched behind her butt, shooting pain into her leg, which also may feel like pain with walking and moving. So- right. It's an important discussion, Barb, on pain because pain is such a subjective thing. When we ask somebody when they come in to see us, we have them fill out a pain reporting scale with a little kind of one to 10 and what your pain is and where it hurts and, you know, circle the face, which best describes how you're feeling, kind of the happy, (laughs) the medium, the sad. And those are all helpful because pain different than like, hey, my finger's dislocated. Oh, I can see your finger's dislocated. Pain is a very subjective measure. Although you can sense when somebody's in pain, you can't really grade it without their help. Mm-hmm. So and what so, do you propose yeah. that she does, that she she should be more specific and, and possibly even revisit this with yeah. her surgeon to I get a so. better I, understanding? I would go see her surgeon, mm-hmm. explain that this is still bugging her quite a lot, mm-hmm. and try and get some more information as to why this is hurting and, and get a plan because- the last thing somebody wants to do is go through a a hip replacement and then have pain, (laughs) pain, right? I mean, that's why you did in the first place. Is that normal for a a year later or a year and a half later to still be uncomfortable? Generally not. Hip replacements are are generally pretty well tolerated. And we get to bring into the, into this video, the best member of this household. Here she is, Liliana Dolce. (laughs) And she is in, and she's going to talk about pain too. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, So no, it's generally- What's her name? Liliana Dolce. Oh, I love it. Hello, Liliana Dolce. She says hello. (laughs) So My dog Pete is around here somewhere, but I shut the door. So he's not in here with me. No No problem. Normally he is. So I was asking you about 
is it normal for like a year and a half later to be pain, but probably not. So she should get it checked out. Sounds correct. Like. Generally speaking, hip replacements of, of the joint replacements are the best tolerated. Those patients tend to do the best earliest, meaning it's normally the case we hear when somebody has a very painful hip and they get it replaced, they're feeling better within a couple of days, better than they were baseline. So a year out, you want to try and figure out why that is. Yep. Okay. That sounds right to me. Here's one from Leslie. She asks, I have severe arthritis in my foot. The doctor I've been seeing said surgery could be very complicated. So I'm interested in hearing more about alternatives to surgery. Barbara, I know you had a positive experience with PRP on your knee arthritis is this something I should try? And what about stem cells? So maybe you could just answer that by first just saying, telling everyone what is PRP. We talked about it a bit in our other episode about knees, but just say what that is. And let's let's hear what your thoughts are on that. Well, let's start by saying what is arthritis. So there are different arthro joint itis inflammation. There are many different types of arthritis. The most common is osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis, meaning the cartilage wears down between the bones, which is what the case was um, with your knee. Mm -hmm. The cartilage wears down between the bones. And when somebody gets an osteoarthritic joint, we try and alleviate the pain to allow them to build strength around that joint. Um, And there are different things we do. Anti-inflammatory medicines, cortisone shots, lubricant shots, PRP, Some are doing stem cells, though I really caution, I don't think the science is quite there yet for stem cells. Right. And then joint replacements. And then there's a whole kind of spectrum of things that we do. Is is that the the surgery to which you refer? That would be a joint replacement for the foot? Is that what they do? Not yet. I'll get to that in a second. Good question. So depending on where these happen in the body, we have different treatment algorithms. So for example, in knees... We know that lubricants and PRP in conjunction with muscle strengthening can really reduce knee arthritic symptoms and make knees feel quite a lot better. It really worked for me. I'm glad to hear that. In shoulders, we have the same, meaning that shoulder arthritis seems to work well with a similar concept. Hips, not as much. Feet, not as much. So it depends on what we're talking about. And then in the foot, there are a, a huge number, uh, something like I believe, 32 joints in the foot that any of these can be arthritic and cause symptoms of pain. And so you want to try and figure out what is the thing that's hurting? Why is it hurting? What can be done? Different than prosthetic knees, so a knee replacement and a, a metal knee or a prosthetic hip, a hip replacement and a metal right. hip, we don't have yet a great answer for that in the foot and ankle. There are some people doing joint replacements in toes, big toes, but the truth of the matter is that it's really not a great answer yet. And that the surgery most often done when a joint becomes very arthritic is called the fusion, fusing the two bones together. And again, it's certainly less developed than the knee and the hip are. So I think with feet, the best answer is strengthening the muscles around the feet working on things like melt, myofascial elongation uh, balls, these little melt balls, or even the the gun, the the soft tissue mobilization gun, gun, massage Mm -hmm. guns. Which I got not too long ago. Yeah. Per your advice. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks for listening. (laughs) And then arch supports. We have patients do things like pick up marbles with their toes or scrunch Mm -hmm. up towels. I do that. I pick up towels or, you know, with my toes and marbles and mm -hmm. and go up and down on my toes like a ballerina. Yeah. But I think Mm -hmm. all these things I would say would help me tell you that foot arthritis, you know, it's not as one size fits all kind of thing. And that there's a lot you can do to the soft tissue around the feet to help. Okay. Now we have a question from Judy who asks, I am active. Yay. Yay, Judy. Yay. (laughs) And love to play pickleball. Okay. And take Mm -hmm. Zumba classes. But now I have an, I hope I'll pronounce it correctly, a piriformis syndrome. Can Dr. Metzl share suggestions on how to manage the pain and possibly cure it, if that's possible? Dr. Metzl, first tell us what is piriformis syndrome. The piriformis muscle is one of the muscles in the back of your hip, in your butt. So you have the gluteal muscles 
And underneath those muscles are a host of smaller muscles, one of which is the piriformis. And the piriformis gains its notoriety because the sciatic nerve out of the spine runs through the piriformis muscle. Mm. Now, piriformis syndrome or a pain in my butt is typically a pain that starts in the butt and shoots down the back of the leg, not to be confused with a hamstring strain, which also starts in the back of the, the top of the hamstring back of the butt and doesn't shoot down the leg quite as far. The difference between these two is that the piriformis pain is a nerve pain. The hamstring pain is a tendon pain where the tendon is pulling on the bone at the top of the butt called the ischial tuberosity. Now, the first thing I would say is that there are some people that have piriformis syndrome, meaning that the muscle in the butt is not strong enough, it's squeezing on the nerve, and that shoots some pain down the back of the leg. However, the vast majority of people that think they have piriformis syndrome actually have a problem in their spine, like a herniated disc or stenosis, mm -hmm. shooting pain into their butt, into their back leg, and they think it's their butt, but it's actually their back that's causing the problem. So my word of caution here is, Make sure you have the right diagnosis because we treat these very differently. The piriformis syndrome is treated with good butt strengthening, glute strengthening exercises. The problem sciatic pain coming out of the back is generally treated with back exercises, sometimes epidural injections. There's a whole different paradigm for treating the back problem compared to treating the butt problem. So you got to figure out, are you a back or are you a butt and go from there? So if it is the back that's causing the pain, as you just described, the lacrosse ball, which is something I use, is that something that's helpful for that, that kind of discomfort? That can help more the butt problem because you're with the lacrosse ball, you're getting into those butt muscles and loosening those up a little bit. Right. That tends not to help the back problem, which is generally a problem of something pushing on the nerve as it exits the spine. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Sally had a similar question to uh, Judy. And mm -hmm. she asked for the best exercises to help alleviate the pain from sciatica. So would you say that the piriformis syndrome really is a form of sciatica? Is that, or is yeah, it different? I'm actually giving a lecture later this year to our sports medicine group called, mm. is there such a thing as piriformis syndrome? Because <laughs> that's a yeah, really, truly, because it has a lot of notoriety, but I'm not sure it really exists. Definitely not to the frequency we think it does. And that most of the people, not all, but most of the people that are complaining of piriformis symptoms are actually having spine problems. But what's the best way to take care of sciatica with exercises? Well, certainly we start all of our patients with exercises. And I love things like planks to build the core muscles around yes. the spine. Those make a huge difference for sure. I love spinal mobility. If you can tolerate it, gentle yoga, Pilates, those kind of things can help a lot. But the key is both activating and strengthening the muscles around the spine. Mm -hmm. Always a good idea. Chris asks, are there any supplements, herbs, or spices that you recommend to your patients for healthy joints? For example, she mentioned turmeric. What do you recommend? Yeah, I do. I do turmeric, glucosamine, and chondroitin are the ones that I do. Okay. And Kathy writes, three months ago, I had a quadruple bypass surgery. She's doing very well, I understand. And my doctor has given me the green light to get back to running. That's great. I still feel tightness across my chest and numbness around my leg where the saphenous vein was removed. I will start off very slowly with the run-walk program. But do you have other advice for how I can safely get back to exercising again after this experience? Yeah, I think that's all great advice for her. Good for her. Um, I mm -hmm. think the key thing is, you know, over 50 for sure. If you're not actively strengthening your muscles, you're getting weaker. Yes. So, you know, exercising is great, but you have to, we've talked about it before. You have to make sure you're building in a strength program to what you're doing several times a week. And so, especially coming after a big surgery like that, yes, building back the strength is hugely important. Yeah. So what do you say? Two to three times a week and really take training. a look at your at your iron strength program. And of course, we'll I have wouldn't. links. I, I, or is that I, too I'm much happy for her? It's too much to start. I would start with like a, a trainer at the gym or something, even a cardiac rehab trainer at the cardiac facility she's at to start building back some strength to start with. Okay. Very good. And we have time for one more question. This one is from me, Dr. Metzl. I do have 
pain in my lower back. It's from diagnosed many years ago, Mm -hmm. degenerative disc disease. And I do find that I get stiff like when I wake up in the morning or if I've been Mm -hmm. sitting for too long. And when I start to move again, it again, movement medicine, right? It really does feel better. But specifically, because I know this is an issue that many, many people in middle life and beyond have, what are the best exercises for me and for others who have lower back pain? I know you mentioned the plank, which I love. Degenerative disc disease means that you're losing the space between the bones in your spine. You're getting arthritis between the bones in your spine. They're normally separated by intervertebral discs, which are kind of plates of cartilage that separate the bones. When those plates wear down, the bones can start to grind, causing degenerative disc disease Mm -hmm. or DDD of the spine, as we say. And you know, as long as you're not getting a ton of nerve pain, nerve symptoms, meaning shooting pain in your legs or toes, Mm -hmm. that can be generally, usually pretty well managed with a combination of mobility and strength. So strength are things like planks. I say three minutes a day, if you can do it, Yep. a minute forward, a minute on each side. And then movement are things such as yoga is a great thing to do, anything to get that spine moving. But what I can tell you is if you sit around and do less, it's going to feel worse. Oh, I, I know that already. Not you. That's not you, absolutely. But if, one, if one does. Oh, if one does. But also that's true of me. If I don't do anything, if I'm still for too long, I do feel discomfort. Me too. But I, I, I do think it's true that even if you know the right thing to do, yeah, knowing the right thing to do for any of us, me, you, anybody, and actually doing it over a lifetime are two very different things. It's really, it's impossible. I don't do the right thing all the time. You don't. People might think, oh, I have this knowledge. I'll do it. But it's not that easy. I mean, the other piece of this that I'm very interested in always is the motivational piece because it's not, it's not a one size fits all. And thinking about motivation is an important thing. And I think that we should have you come back on to talk specifically about motivation, because as I said, when I brought you on, you are one of the most motivating people I've ever met. And everyone listening, if you have not yet seen him in action, (laughs) conducting the Iron Strength Program, which he does very often in New York City on the Intrepid in Central Park, it is something to behold, very motivating and um that is a, a key component of the success of movement medicine is being motivated to actually do what you know is the right thing to do. That's actually the next book I'm working on is a book on the science of motivation, because I think that's exactly true. One thing is knowing it. One thing is doing it. Yes. And uh, they're very separate things. They really, really are. And you know, my motto, which I say often, and in fact, it's in the pre-recorded outro to every single episode is we can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. I mean, everyone yeah. knows the right thing, but yeah. you can control it by doing it. <laughs> yeah. Right? Which sounds easy. So I'm but looking it's not. forward to that, but it's Good. not easy. It is not easy. No. No. So I, I hope you come back and you kind of give us some more tips about that. This was very specific today. It was talking about you know how to deal with some of the aches and pains that come our way as we get older. And thank you for that. But no uh, motivation, that's coming up next. So you'll be back on the show. Just give us your one most important takeaway from our conversation today for the Gruff Talk audience. Listen, we had a lot of different topics today. I guess my one big take home for this, listening to all the different things that people asked, is that everybody that wrote has different kinds of pain and that pain happens for a reason and that it's important to try and figure out what that reason is by getting a proper diagnosis. So don't rely on your friend or your trainer at the gym or reading something in a magazine to say, all right, I have this kind of pain, I'm gonna do this. That pain happens for a cause get a proper diagnosis as to what that cause is, and then make a plan appropriate to try and fix that. Yeah, that's great advice. And again, we look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode of Gruff Talk, please do two things. First, share it with all your friends and family and subscribe to Gruff Talk wherever you listen to podcasts, including YouTube, so you never miss a single episode. Until next time, remember this, 
We can't control getting older, but we can control how we do it. Talk to you soon. Age Better Podcast is a proud member of the Sound Advice Network. Sound Advice, women's voices amplified.